Good morning. Uh, clearly, uh, people come back, but uh, so far, uh, the cybersphere has, uh, is a little less popular than Asia, as uh, uh, people, people may be more interested in where they see a crisis and potent risks of war. Can I just uh, try to get your attention, saying that we have a kind of daily wars in the cybersphere, so it would be worth our attention. So uh, uh, I'm honored to facilitate this session. My name is Paul Hermelin. I run uh, Capgemini, which is a, a large uh, consultancy, French-based. And uh, before that, I've spent 15 years in the public service in France, so kind of a double culture. Uh, we have a prestigious speaker, uh, Mr. Carl Bildt, uh, his Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, and was a prime minister in Sweden for several years. Then Mr. Uh, Chong, who runs a, a media company in Korea, and Mr. Mer Mr. Mayor Shitrit, who is a member of the Knesset in Israel, and knows particularly well the security issues that uh, Israel faces. So I'd like to start with a little introduction. I think the uh, here, the name is cyberspace, when cyber refers to cybernetics and robotics. Personally, I, I would use the word infosphere, uh, because it's the sphere of information. And I want to say, uh, we, we, we should try to address the question with the direction that Thierry has put for this conference, which is the, the global governance question. Uh, the, the cybersphere is uh, moving extremely fast. Today is probably one of the major determination of our society in terms of contribution to the GDP growth. I think people do not necessarily know it, and we should not be proud of that, but uh, the information sphere uh, is at the origin of 10% of the carbon emission on the planet. Uh, so uh, uh, nothing to be proud of, but it's a significant factor. Uh, behind, of course, uh, transportation and a few other, but it's growing. Uh, we have, uh, we probably attract a, a very fast growing number of hours of the population that spends today more hours in front of their mobile device and PC than in front of television in emerged economies. Huh? So today uh, we are the first uh, leisure of mankind and uh, the infosphere has been a change agent, notably everybody would speak of the Arab Spring and the speed of uh, communication through uh, uh, the, the internet, but uh, people also will refer to the famous uh, new models of campaigning showed by notably the Democrats in the Obama campaign, where uh, the internet has become an extraordinary vehicle for uh, communication and conviction and winning democratic battle. So what are the, the, the key features of that infosphere? First, it's truly shaped and dominated by uh, innovation and innovation led by private corporation. First big wave was the, the emergence of uh, personal computing and personal computing was a combination of, of course, uh, IBM in that invented the PC, followed by uh, Microsoft that led to a, a big domination of what people at the moment in time uh, were calling Wintel. Wintel was uh, uh, the contraction of Windows and Intel. So Windows was Microsoft, the, operation, the operational system, the operating system, and Intel that manufacture chips that were found in most PC. Now, uh, I think I, I watch the audience. Most of you uh, communicate while being here uh, through a smart device. Uh, you can call that a mobile phone, but I would just say these are the new interface into the web sphere. It's clear that we are connected all the time, and notably one of the problems that uh, we, a private employer, face is when we recruit what we used to, what we now call the Generation Y, but there will be soon a Generation Z, and I don't know what will be the next letter. Uh, our employee remain connected 
even during working hours. I mean, uh, you can't prevent a young, I would call that netizens, uh, citizens of the net, to remain on the net and connected at any point in time, and he would be connected to his community, let's call it uh, LinkedIn or Facebook, but these are the innovation driver. What were so far, uh, what are so far the only attempt for uh, a public uh, governance? Uh, uh, of course, the news flow is full of the post Snowden uh, uh, earthquake, uh, because uh, people could probably guess it, but of course, we saw one of the superpowers trying to, I would say, uh, collect intelligence of what are the you know, information that flow on the internet and try to control it. This has triggered a shockwave that will not end, we'll come back on that. So we have, in the US, the combination of massive private innovation and an attempt by the US federal state to remain in control and be in a position to scrutinize, first get to know intelligence, scrutinize, of course manage the data, and now the big tools that we call big data allow people to collect data and uh, build intelligent information out of that. I would mention also uh, the other superpower, uh, the Chinese one, that tries more to build barriers, walls, and protection to be immune against that potential information invasion. But if you look deeper into what is the internet governance, it's very interesting to look at the World Wide Web governance itself, technically. The first thing is, the first body that was designed is called the Internet Architecture Board. So it was designed by techies, so the first thing they thought about was how to maintain the integrity of the architecture of the internet. The second body is the Internet Engineering Steering Group, so still engineers dealing with their technical problem. And as the third body, you find what is a truly attempt to do a global governance, which is called the Internet Society, the ISOC. And the Internet Society defines itself as, and that's the challenge for today, a non-profit, non-governmental, international of gathering of professional members that feel in charge of standards, technology, education, and policy issues. So the people that feel empowered of managing all the political issues of that gigantic sphere of communication that mankind has invented are a gathering of non-governmental international individuals that think they drive the future of that sphere. And that's, I think, is the challenge. I just uh, uh, remind everybody, that in, in 2011, uh, President Sarkozy, that was uh, driving the G8, uh, tried to convene what we had called at the time a EG8, E referring to electronic, the e-business, the EG8 in May 2011. And I attended that conference, and it was a strange confrontation between some governmental representative and most of the business leaders trying to find a compromise. And frankly, the conclusion of the EG8 were rather shy, rather limited. I think uh, the conclusion, as always with this diplomatic document, was uh, a common agreement that we need to give a new impetus for freedom and democracy. That goes without saying, but why not? And trying to articulate what could be the basic principle of that information sphere. First, freedom. Second, respect for privacy, and we'll take later of that, on, about that. Respect of intellectual property. There you saw the large US corporation claiming for uh, keep the ownership of their innovation. Accept multiplayer governance. The principle is nice, but once stated, nobody knows what it truly means, as I refer to the Internet Society. A big claim for cyber security and protection against crime. Uh, as I told you, I attended this uh, 
works and conference, and notably a uh, uh, very interesting meeting between uh, President Sarkozy and uh, several US leaders. And what is striking is uh, in the infosphere, any attempt to regulate or control has become obsolete before the attempt even gets an approval at international level. There was recently an attempt in the, at the EU level to regulate the data treatment and transfer, and notably how data can, should be handled and potentially transported out of the EU physical borders. And uh, there was an EU summit, commit this time by the French president, François Hollande, and their main decision was they could not agree on a pre a precise principle, so they postponed the question to 2015. So it just showed that the speed of international regulation and global governance just don't, do not match the speed of innovation. Because what is seen as key today will become obsolete very soon. And I think that's the, the main challenge of that infosphere is the discontinuity between the pace, the majesty of international governance and the, the way in technical innovation blossom. I just a, a few days ago, uh, I think it was Facebook that tried to buy something that has no revenue called Snapchat. I don't know if you heard of that, but uh, youngsters in the US uh, send uh, some video and sometimes uh, this video can be uh, provocative. So uh, Snapchat had invented a new method where the little video self-destroy after 15 seconds to protect privacy. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the rumor is that Facebook offered $2 billion to buy Snapchat. Uh, and the Snapchat uh, owner uh, refused, by the way. Uh, uh, the strange thing is there are already applications available, be they on the uh, uh, Apple standard or Android Google standard, that if you get a Snapchat video, you instantly copy it on your PC so that it, the, the, it cannot be destroyed because you have safeguarded it and stored it on your PC before the system even destroys it. So just show you uh, the crazy figures the speed of innovation and the counter reaction, which make it very difficult to regulate. So uh, we are in a world of uh, entrepreneurs, but also not only uh, the nice little entrepreneur, we have a very large corporation. People just wonder if Google will not invent the new automotive. I know they are working on a Google car that refers to automated car where people would give the control of their car to the system. And uh, Google is able to do that thanks to their gigantic uh, position in the infosphere. But more difficult, we are in front of netizens, youngsters that have been born in that world and not, do not uh, necessarily understand what we call uh, privacy. I just say, I've asked my daughter if she didn't feel at risk to put so many information on her Facebook profile <coughs> just wondering if one day she wouldn't regret it because possibly, let's say, an employer would have access to a lot of private information. And her answer was, if I do the, don't do that, then the employer will find I'm a very secretive person and would not hire me versus other people that share the same information. So it's a new world. It's a new world with new behavior. And I'd like to, to end my introduction with something that I found mostly paradoxical. I don't know if you pay attention to that, but on December 9th, so only a very few years ago, uh, a few companies, but uh, when I will give you the list, it's quite impressive, uh, uh, challenged the US government thinking that the spying of the internet was harming their performance and their business. So the way they say it was, People won't use technology they don't trust. Government have put this trust at risk and government need to help restore it. What they meant is all everything we heard about spying communication 
is harming their ability to do business. And the list of companies that issued that challenge to the US government was Microsoft, Google, AOL, Twitter, Facebook, Yahoo, Apple, and LinkedIn. So you see, all the net giants thought that their business is more important than uh, privacy, than security, and said to the government, the US government, the way you control, the way you are now known to control and somewhat spy communication harms the trust of the people, the netizens in our technology, and you are harming us. I do not know of the US society will overcome that contradiction. Huh? It's very clear that what was very new, but we see today, I think that that's why I thought uh, Thierry was absolutely right to put this at the heart of this conference. The main problem of that growing share of our society is how can we build a governance that will not only look backwards and look at control, but will be able to manage the contradiction between the speed of innovation and the space of the, the attempt to build any uh, rule, regulation that would not destroy innovation. I think that's an introduction to our debate, and now I will leave the floor to Mr. Chang. Uh, uh, we have today uh, two representatives of the private world, Mr. Chang from Korea from a media group, and then two representatives of the re potential regulators, the public world, Mr. Merchetrit and Mr. Bill. So, Mr. Chak, I leave the floor to you. Good morning. I, I am uh, comfortable uh, here taking the podium and stand and speak to you. Okay, the moderator uh, told us lots of introduction and uh, uh, many new applications, and I'll uh, continue uh, from his remarks. And uh, the title of my presentation this morning is Media in the Digital Ecosystem. Uh, briefly uh, introducing myself, uh, I print uh, about one million copies daily. It's a business newspaper, and I own uh, two channels, uh, broadcasting channels on cable network, and I also have a uh, service to uh, inter internet. Uh, so my audience, daily audience, uh, turns out to be uh, about 10 million to 15 million. And so I challenge many problems in the cyberspace, and uh, I try to uh, summarize some words, what's happening in this media business. And I came out with the four words, uh, change, challenge, choice, and chance. And I'll go over these uh, you know, problems. OK, change. The moderator just said the speed of change is enormous. Uh, the, your society is uh, changing uh, much faster than you think. Uh, so uh, the media's job, media service, must be uh, instantaneous and real-time uh, delivery uh, must be your uh, service. And let's look at this picture. Uh, the picture was taken in uh, 2005 uh, at the uh, St. Peter's uh, Square. Uh, somebody in your uh, journalism school uh, might have seen this picture. And uh, you know the crowds gathered here for paper uh, conclave is uh, rather you know, emotionless. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, there's only one person uh, taking a picture with a smartphone. But move to the, uh, this year, 2013, when Pope Francis uh, became a pope. Uh, at the same square, same St. Peter's Square, uh, you might think uh, everyone's holding a candle. Uh, to commemorate new pope, uh, but uh, they are having this uh, smartphone. The one in the middle, um, he has this big uh, tablet PC. Uh, so lots of change is happening in the media industry. And let's look at this uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Uh, this bold man uh, purchased the uh, 
most respected newspaper in the United States for only uh, $250 million. Uh, if the price was that low, uh, I could even challenge him uh, to purchase uh, this uh, respected Washington Post. A uh, friend of mine uh, talked to Graham family, uh, I mean, sending him, giving him condolence, you know, uh, unloading his family business for 136 years. And uh, Mr. Graham uh, told my friend uh, he's quite happy to get rid of this newspaper, uh, but uh, the price was too low. Many newspapers, many news media is owned by family, uh, but these families are getting rid of these businesses, uh, like the, the Wall Street Journal went to Murdoch, and the Washington Post, Amazon, and the Boston Globe is on sale now, and Forbes magazine, Forbes magazine is a great magazine, uh, is on sale again. Uh, Forbes family uh, ran this magazine, uh, they are sort of, uh, tired of uh, making magazines. And you know that the Business Week magazine was, uh, went to Bloomberg service and uh, Huffington Post, uh, Ariana Huffington uh, founded this uh, online uh, newspaper. Now it's owned by uh, AOL. Uh, this lady is smiling because uh, the social network uh, called Tumblr uh, was acquired by Yahoo, and Yahoo paid 1.1 billion US dollars. Uh, so these two episodes symbolize the change in the landscape of the media industry. Okay, uh, we all know that uh, stories from Egypt and Tunisia, uh, when Arab Spring happened, uh, people said, uh, people didn't say that CNN will come and broadcast uh, our revolution, uh, but they said this revolution will be tweeted to everywhere. Uh, broadcasting is disappearing, uh, and Twitter is overtaking broadcasting. So newspapers, television uh, might disappear. Uh, Bill Gates said that uh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, I, I was very worried uh, 15 year, years ago at Davos when I heard that uh, story, but I'm still here. Uh, I'm not uh, making billions of dollars like uh, younger ones, but I'm still here. But uh, look at the uh, current trend of uh, newspaper circulation. Uh, it's coming down. Uh, the orange bar, orange is uh, Orange represents uh, Asian uh, circulation. Uh, Asia took over. Uh, the green one, green one was uh, United Europe, and the blue one uh, next to it is United States. Uh, year 2008, uh, Europe used to be the largest newspaper market, uh, but this is changing. And uh, what about the advertising revenue? Okay, Asian markets now is as big as United States, uh, Europe, a little bit below that. Uh, so who took the money from newspapers or print made media? Uh, I would say it's Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, publishers like me, we call them uh, enemies of newspapers. Okay, this young guy, uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook, uh, he said, we want to give people the best personalized newspaper. Personalized newspaper meaning uh, customized newspaper. Uh, you don't want to read uh, articles you don't like. You only like to read articles uh, you are fond of. So again, uh, younger generation, uh, this one with uh, lots of hair on head, uh, making good money. And the Google, Google uh, dominates the uh, internet world. Uh, this can be a problem for every society or sometimes uh, monopolizing the market more than 70%, uh, 80%. Uh, we all know that what happened to AT&T in the United States, uh, breaking up of business uh, organization could be an answer or maybe not an answer. Uh, or the Google should be more prosperous and bigger and bigger. Uh, we don't know the answer yet. 
But the one thing I'm sure is that the Google says uh, news must be free to use. Uh, this, this kind of comment is hated by uh, most of publishers around the world. Then we are concerned with the quality journalism at, at stake. Uh, many of you remember that uh, Superman was a journalist. He was a reporter uh, <laughs> at uh, one of the uh, newspaper company in New York, I think. Uh, but even Superman cannot easily save newspapers these days. So who's going to check and balance the unrestrained power? Uh, this will be the great challenge uh, for the uh, Internet society. Now go to uh, choice. I choice, I meant the business opportunity for print media. Uh, there are many ideas coming up uh, how we're going to cope with this uh, new uh, business media environment. Uh, number one is monetization. Uh, why should people don't pay anything to us? Uh, like in my case, I have about 600 uh, journalists uh, who work for me. I mean, these people work day and night. Uh, they are extremely determined to service the country. Uh, but why should their contents must be free? I uh, disagree with uh, you know, free contents to everyone. In the uh, United States, about 48% of uh, publishers uh, have a paid uh, content model uh, going on. And uh, there are many newspapers uh, talking about uh, becoming mobile. Uh, we have mobile best strategy. Uh, this newsroom is a uh, Fox News Fox News Company newsroom. Uh, they try to integrate uh, print, online service, and mobile at the same time. So their screen is much bigger than your small iPad. So uh, in my case too, I try to integrate newspapers, two TV channels, uh, internet service, and mobile. But I learned that uh, people have different skills. Uh, print journalists cannot easily become uh, television journalists, or they cannot become easily mobile journalists. So we journalists have a limited capability, capacity, to do only one thing at a time. And the big data, uh, we are moving toward the big data society. And uh, this uh, cartoon is that uh, trying to tell you that a uh, newsroom might have what marketers want. And uh, like the New York Times, uh, they're retargeting the services. Uh, they closely track the newspaper website visitors uh, for their marketing services. And uh, real-time uh, bidding system to people uh, is an illustration uh, what's happening in this picture. Uh, we all know that uh, Google's uh, challenging new services. Uh, this is Google Glass uh, trying to report the crime scene uh, real time online uh, to the newsroom. Okay, and uh, some of you might have bought the Samsung uh, Galaxy Gear uh, with the uh, wearable watch on your hand. Uh, these uh, new uh, media devices uh, becoming a killer application. Again, uh, robots will appear. Uh, myself, I myself is interested in uh, computer-driven journalism. Uh, can I save on uh, human being cost? Uh, can I have my computer uh, write articles? Uh, it's near. And uh, we have drone uh, flying over uh, mostly Middle East, uh, fighting against terrorism. But uh, next, uh, Pope Conclave, uh, I believe that uh, drone will show up. Drone uh, equipped with the camera will show up. I tried to use this drone in Korea, but Korea is uh, facing North Korea in uh, militaristic confrontation. I learned that 
I'm not allowed to use drone in the city. <laughs> uh, but outside of city, maybe I could use drone journalism. Okay, the New York Times won the Pulitzer Prize by giving a multimedia journalism. Uh, it's uh, nothing new, just uh, try to mix video, data, photo, infographics, and you finally comes up with a finished article. Okay, uh, so media people, especially print media, is not just sitting like dark. Uh, we'll try to look for chance and business opportunity and uh, I have uh, Bezo again here. Uh, he talks about the future of the newspaper. Uh, he, many newspaper publishers wondered why Bezo of Amazon uh, purchased Washington Post. Uh, what's his big idea for the next stage? And Bezo likes to have a real personal media. I mean, he's. Uh, waving his trophy, Washington Post. Uh, so we are closely watching him. Uh, what will be his new uh, business profit model in the future? I know everyone uh, interested in uh, social uh, network use, but people uh, analyze that 95% uh, of information exposed by Twitter is noise. So people want uh, verified articles with accuracy and authority. And uh, we don't like rumors, just simple rumors. Uh, we want to have uh, authoritative uh, news uh, coming from major news company. Authenticity, legitimacy, and sincerity is the ones we like to look into cyberspace. And what about digital dementia? And I know you people sitting here uh, connecting the smartphones with your office and uh, giving orders to uh, your secretaries and uh, listening to music. Uh, you're using multimedia and multitasking. And uh, you are exposed to uh, digital dementia. So uh, try to read a print paper. Uh, newspaper will filter out all kinds of rumors, news coming out of uh, new devices. So I'm a little bit optimistic that uh, good newspapers will survive uh, through the next generation and continuously look for uh, business opportunity and media is a communication. Uh, I think it will last uh, as long as uh, mankind exists. And I finally come up with the uh, future of media. Uh, let's look at this uh, diagram. Okay, uh, newspaper must make money uh, to uh, service uh, good journalists. Okay, monetization is going to be the real problem for most of the newspapers. And uh, we have uh, technology disruption coming. So mobile, social, big data, uh, how are we going to adapt to these new technologies? And the human values are important. Uh, humanistic uh, value, uh, they make uh, great journalists. Uh, after all, journalists are uh, human beings with the good ideas. So putting together three of these area, uh, I think uh, innovation will come for the next newspapers. Uh, before I was coming to uh, Charles de Gaulle and continue to uh, Monaco, uh, last week Google people came to see me. Mm. I don't like Google people. Uh, I told you <laughs> they are the enemies of newspapers. Uh, but uh, they want to live together with uh, print media. Uh, he, uh, they suggested uh, Google application, Google Docs, uh, moderator talked about it, and cloud service, and Google Hangout. Uh, maybe in five years from now, uh, Professor Montreal, you don't have to get all these people here together. Uh, we just go to Google Hangout and have a uh, conference. And you save lots of money there. And uh, Snapchat, okay, you talked about Snapchat. That's another device. 
And what about Flipboard? Okay, this is another SNS service. And uh, one of the interesting new services comes out as Evernote. Evernote is an uh, application. It's a private search engine. And it may become your external brain. Uh, your brain has uh, limited capacity. But now, uh, by using the cloud service everywhere, uh, your brain capacity uh, expands immensely. Okay. And again, uh, 75 billion users already using this Evernote. Uh, lastly, uh, last page, please. Okay. Uh, this is a comment by Eric Schmidt, Eric Schmidt of Google. Uh, he comes to visit Korea once a year, snooping around, uh, make sure that uh, <laughs> Google is the, still the number one, uh, make sure that uh, Samsung uh, is behind. Uh, he said, uh, right now, about two billion people around the globe has internet access. But his mission is to have five billion people. Okay, I only have like a 15 million audience, and Google's talking about five billion people. Uh, so we are living in the internet of everything. Uh, internet of everything society is a network of smart devices that communicate each other with a little human intervention to data centers, wearable products, and new devices, so and so. I think there will be no privacy, no humanity. Uh, machine to machine, society might prevail. Uh, driving cars, I mean, driverless cars, is already on the road. Uh, they've been testing these cars for several years back, okay? So I think let's get prepared to M2M society and machine-to-machine -machine society. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm glad again to be here. It is wonderful to be with you again in this panel. And uh, you heard now from my, uh, from my colleague some of the benefits of the internet. It makes our life much more easier, much more comfortable, much more accessible to everywhere. I would like to share with you some of the downsides of the internet. And you know, the modern battlefield had been changed very drastically. The battle today is not only airplanes, tanks, or infantry. Part of the, of the game today, part of the war is, uh, is what they call the cyber war warriors, or cyber war. Since the middle of the 90s, we see this cyber war in different places in the world, as so I will in a few minutes show you examples. The two targets of this war, of this cyber war, is to paralyze sites, that's the way it started, and to leave a signature in those sites in order to show you that they have been there, you are transparent, we can get in whenever you want and do whatever we want. This is what I mean of paralyzing sites. The second is, of course, making damages to infrastructures. On the second Lebanese war, we have Israel in Israel with the Hezbollah. We've seen a lot of hackers attacking Israeli sites very strongly. That's the reaction many Israeli hackers attacked the Hezbollah sites, and we saw <coughs> during the, on the real time, we saw the damages in both sides. Which try, I'm trying to say is that today, in order to make a state collapse, you don't need to conquer it or to go in with your army. <coughs> you don't need tank, you don't need airplanes. All you need is a computer 
and a keyboard. And uh, we're not far away from there. In the summer of 2007, Estonia had been attacked by hackers. People think they are Russians. And the state was collapsed. All their infrastructure was collapsed. Communications stopped working, banks, electricity. And that was just one demonstration of what, we can, you do, what can you do with a cyber war. You can really create a situation of paralyzing totally state. You know, one of the aims of hackers today is to have such control over a state that they can use it for extort for just for making money by aiming. They hook, if, they, if somebody will pick a pe telephone to one of the leaders of a state, aiming that if he not do such and such, for example, don't pay to him a few hundred million dollars, he will paralyze his state. It is a big, big power to someone to do it, and it's not impossible. So part of their aim of those hackers is to have such a control over states, trying to extract, to extort, to try to get from it money from different countries. I would like to show you some Israel experience. We're living, as you know, in a very difficult neighborhood. I'd like to share with you some of our uh, experience about the cyber, what we're doing towards it. I want to share it to you because I think everybody has to take it in consideration in your countries. We establish the INCCB, what's called Israel National Cyber Bureau. It had been established a few years ago, and the idea of this uh, cyber bureau, it was established and the government decided on it formally in uh, 2012, but in matter of fact, we started to establish it a few years ago, five or six years ago. There are many organizations that had been built up in this uh, bureau. Um, there are many units as well in the security services and in the defense uh, ministry. And all of it is under the authority of the prime minister. I'll try to explain why. It's not only a matter of defense, because if it, only, if it was only security, all those units are supposed to be in, this, in the defense ministry. As I said, we can, you can suffer from a big damages in your, all your infrastructure. Therefore, you need to protect those infrastructures. And if in order to protect it, it's not enough to operate a person or two or three or one unit. You have to look in a very large system, which means you need always to prepare your warriors in order to protect your internet and your sites and your infrastructure. You have to, in order to do it, you have to develop all the time new technologies. In order to develop new technologies, you need research. In order to have right research, you need to have a very big quantities of students who are studying physics, mathematics in a very high level. So you have to take care of many, many systems in your country in order to be ready and to be in awareness, in the right awareness, and have the ability to protect and to offense if you need it. That's the reason why we put it under the uh, authority of the Prime Minister, because you need somebody who have the power really to move those systems ahead. What are the main threats? As I said, one of them is the IT protection, IT of the government. You know, every government have an e-government sites that people can use to connect with the government, having services, etc. If somebody attack it, they can paralyze the operation of this government to, towards the people. Second, in the main infrastructure protection. Now, you know that today, most of the infrastructure uh, elements are controlled by computers. And if you can get to those computers, you can do whatever you want in those systems. Suppose I give you just an example. Suppose that you're just taking control over the light system on the roads of a country. And you can change it the way you like. You put every one of them green. It will be a disaster. It's quite a simple thing. As well, you can totally paralyze all the production of electricity in a country if you get into the computers that supervise electrical power plants. 
And of course, the same goes with the nuclear power plants. If you can get to those computers, you can touch and make a big damages everywhere. So protecting this infrastructure is very crucial to the possibility of a state really to keep on their own systems working. Uh, that's the reason why many units have been established from our, in our case. There is a unit in the Ministry of Public Security, which its responsibility is for protecting all the main infrastructure connected and supervised by computers. As well, there are special units which have been established in order to protect the government sites, IT like e-government and Tihila, which prevent possibility to attack those sites. Just to add one more point, you have heard, of course, about the stockneck worm that attacked the centrifuges in Iran. It was a very, very complicated uh, virus, which get into those uh, uh, centrifuges and make a big damages to the Iranian. It took two years until the Iranian find out about this worm or this virus. And the question was, there is one question, when you use, when somebody use offense and using some virus, how he prevent that this virus will not go back to his own systems? So for example, we're speaking about this Stuxnet. This virus was so sophisticated that he act only in certain type of centrifuges, only those of Siemens from a certain type which are in Iran, which means if this virus was go to some other centrifuges in different place, different country, it will not work. And of course, when they find it, they send it to laboratory in Russia which find out and explode it to the world that it exists. I give it an example because Centrifax is not managed, there is no computer in the Centrifax. It's just a me me mechanical machine with electrical engine which turn it very, very, very fast. But those Centrifax are supervised by computer. So if you can touch that computer, you can, of course, making a big damages to the center facts. That's what happens in Iran, a big, very big, very big damages. What are the main threats? The main cyber threats is to infrastructure, as I said before, the water, electricity, transportation, banks, stock market, communication, etc. almost everything. You can really paralyze a total country. Stats next, as I explained now, was just an example. I would like to bring some more examples. And at 2007, Edward Selden uh, explored this uh, a, a, a disclosure, the attack over Estonia, as I said before. In June, 2000, June 2010, uh, as I said, the Stuxnet was working in uh, Iran. March 12, 2011, NASA admit that within two years, 13 successful attacks had been launched against its computer, and they lost the control over the, net of the uh, space, space station. In 29 of five, 20, 29, 28 of uh, May 11, which written here is not, I'm sorry, it's, it's a mistake, a service of the uh, service of security company of Lockheed Martin had been attacked. They didn't attack. They had been attacked very seriously. And in this attack, we find out that they took over from Lockheed Martin. They took all the plans of the new jets, F-55, F-35, very sophisticated weapons, strategical weapons in the future. Everything had been taken by those attacks. And the suspicious was that the one who did it was the Chinese. So somebody asked how they know that it is Chinese, because usually nobody is attacking really from sites in his own country. Usually everybody uses a server in a different country far away from here in order not to connect it. The, and this had been answered by Americans saying that in order to make such an attack of a Lockheed Martin, you need, it is a, Planes that people, thousands of people were working many years to ride them. 
So in order to really take over over them, you need to work with hundreds of people for four years at least. And the ability that somebody will operate hundreds of people working may four years in order to at attack these sites is possible only by China. Go ahead and another, some more examples. September 2011, Iranian hackers broke into the computers of Netherlands information security company and forged documents that allowed them to access to the sites of the Mossad, CIA, and MI6. In December 2011, Saudian hackers announced that they download 400,000 Israelis credit card details. As a response, Israeli hackers struck into the details of the Saudian credit cards, which was a big fight at the time. In November 2011, hackers took control over the water pump system in Illinois and Texas, not only to make damages, but only to show United States that they are not protected that there are exposure to any attack they want to do. And in May 2012, the, uh, a flame had been disclosure, which is, according to, according to uh, experts, it is 20 times more sophisticated than the stock snipe. Okay, therefore, we decided that we need an ecosystem in order to tackle all those problems. And now it's not only a matter of attacking. It's, it's not a matter of defending. You have to have the both possibilities. And you know, you have to do it at once. That's the reason why you need ecosystem and not a different uh, stations. We have to have a synchronize between all of them. In Second World War, Great Britain had three different parts of the Air Force. One is protecting the seashores of England, second to protect the skies of England, and the third was to attack outside of England. Of course, today it's impossible. Air Force is one, and therefore, today as well, we need that everything which work or deal with cyberspace will be in one hand synchronized very strongly in order not to prevent situation that, just theoretically, okay? We would like to take some information from certain computers over there somewhere. On the same time, other unit of cyber will attack this computer to strike it, to paralyze it. That will be stupidity, right? We need this computer to stay alive you know, if you want to take any information from it. So you need to have a very, very good synchronization. That's the reason why we need such an ecosystem. And of course, there are difficulties and obstacles to that in this way. Why? Regulation. Of course, you need, in order to have the ability to do such a thing, you need regulation. Government have to make special legislation in order to allow the possibility of a government really to protect every infrastructure. Otherwise, you cannot protect it. Even if you have the means and the possibility, you cannot, you cannot protect it. In the United States, for example, one of the problems of the government of the United States, they don't want to take responsibility over the protection, let's say, of the finance system, private finance system because they say it's hurting privacy, and therefore they don't want to take responsibility on it. I think it's a mistake, because it's really very possible and very easy to attack those, those systems. Trend blocks. Suppose you go to a bank in Israel and said, we want to protect your site against any attack from outside. The bank said, if people will know that you are taking protection, it means you, maybe you are looking in our mind count, so it is hurting privacy. Again, you need right legislation which will not hurt the privacy of people and still giving you the ability really to make such a protection over those sites. And of course, this is privacy is very important. Those are the obstacles. Now, technology development. Changes in this technology, in the regular technology, takes 10 years, 20 years. Look at cars. Since the car had been invented, it took many, many years to make a real change in any special change in this a te technology. In this technology of cyberspace, a generation is one year and a half, no more than that. So you cannot take some expert to protect your country and forget it now for the next five or ten years and you know, one day you wake up with a total disaster. You have to follow up all the time. You have to operate those systems day by day and developing all the time, developing technology, 
if a year or a year and a half pass, you have a totally different technology. And if you're not prepared, you have no protection. Everything which you've done before is dead. This technology can require a constant development. And you have to be always in a constant alert, always, all the time. Having technology is not enough. There can be many, many damaging damages, surprising damages, very strongly if somebody would decide to attack you. So therefore, it's not enough to have technology. You need to have the right warriors. And I'd like to show you something that General Alexander United States says. He said, he said the cyber warrior, somebody who can want to be a cyber warrior, have to have the, the experience of 10 years at least in building networks, defending net, uh, networks, and operating in a cyberspace. How many people have such an experience? Very few. David Dietrich said, what are the cyber warriors? He said, we can reasonably conclude that it would take more than 10 years of experience at the highest level of CNO, which is computer network operator, in order to have cyber defense and offense capacity. Which means in order really to prepare cyber warriors, you need to invest a lot of money and a lot of time. You cannot just take some amateurs to do it. You need, you need, you need professional people who sometimes they dedic dedicated their life to that. You know, in the United States, they have three million IP people. 60% of them are living in a fear because they don't know nothing about cyberspace and so they can do, they cannot protect their own systems. The United States budget today for cyber is $4.7 billion a year. I don't know what the budget of your countries, but I suggest double it without knowing it. You need much more. You have to really invest in it a lot if you want to protect yourself. Therefore, we're speaking about general ecosystem. It's supposed to give us a combination of industry, security, education, government awareness proper, and legislation. You have to do all of it together and synchronize them in order really to have the right answer. Israel is a target. Israel is the most attacked target in the world. We have almost 100,000 attacks per day. And during, the, let's say, Gaza war, Lebanese war, we have more than a million attacks per day. But if you go to the next, and the last uh, chart, you say that according to McPhee reports, there are people who are <coughs> grading countries according to their protection. The McPhee threats report ranks Israel as the country of the most prepared for cyber threat along with Sweden and Poland. Which even we have such, we have become such a target which are much, much, uh, many, many people and countries who want to attack our sites and attack Israel. We have the right uh, protection because we were prepared for it. <clears throat> and we have to. We're living, as I said, in a very, very difficult neighborhood. So we have always to be in awareness. I think that usually we're afraid of what we don't know. If we know it, we don't afraid. Therefore, our task in every country is to learn it very seriously, to invest the money needed in order to prepare the right people to protect it. Otherwise, we'll be in a very bad situation if we have any war or conflict. And I'd like to say in the last ending by saying that in this situation of today, sometimes you see a young man which is much more powerful and better than a full division of the army. A good cyber warrior can do damages much more stronger, much more bigger than any army division, including Air Force and everything else. That's unbelievable, but it is true. Thank you. Thank you. Much has been said. As a matter of fact, most things have been said, but um, let me make some remarks. The word 
is changing very fast. We are in this respect in the midst of the most revolutionary scientific and technological revolution that mankind has ever seen. And what we see now is the world is going broadband, the world is going mobile, the world is going cloud, the world is going big data, the world is going to hyper-connectivity and doing it very fast. Just the mobility part of it, because that I think is very important. We are used to the word of the copper lines and the fixed networks. That is all disappearing when we go mobile. Within five years, 65% of the population of the world will be covered by mobile networks that are more capable than the ones we have in Europe today. 65% of the world within five years on present trends. This transforms everything. There's no business model left that will be able to withstand the pressure of change. There's no government, no economy that will not be profoundly affected. The economic impact, the economic opportunity is of course uh, fairly obvious. The World Bank has tried to calculate which are the economic opportunities coming here and looking of course primarily at developing world as they should. And they are saying, broadly speaking, that if you have a 10% increase of broadband penetration, you have a 1% to 1.2% in the economic growth rate. If that is true, and I have no reason to doubt it, is the most powerful development tool that we've ever seen. It is the most powerful tool that we've had of bridging the gap between the rich and the poor in the world. And I would argue that within 10 years, the famous digital divide that we all talk about is not going to be a question of geogra geography, it's going to be a question of generations. The digital divide is within every business, within every society, within every nation. Uh, it reminds me of a story by a friend of mine who used to be Israeli Minister for Intelligence or Security or whatever, David Meridor. And he told me that when they were setting up within his sphere of responsibility, different working groups on doing things, whatever they do, which was broadly indicated what they do, um, I think he had as a rule of a thumb, I said, that he wanted to have on that working group all the time a number of people that were less than 18 years of age. Otherwise, he said, they won't understand what's going on in the world. I've tried to apply that in Sweden, but I have miserably failed. Um, they're obviously, so the transformational power is enormous of what we are seeing, but the opportunities are vast, primarily for the developing world. I stumble on the fact uh, this morning or coming down on the flight yesterday, as a matter of fact, that if you look at Nigeria, I mean, the biggest internet economy in the world, the biggest internet user in the world is of course China. But the number seven in the world is Nigeria. And within five years, uh, no, within three years, on President Nigeria has got to be number five in the world. You hadn't really foreseen that happen. The security issues are fairly obvious, and we see them on all sorts of levels. We have to personally make certain that our systems are secure, the ones that we use. If you are in business, which many of you are, the financial services are, of course, extremely dependent upon the security. If people go to their banks and put their money in it, they want that money not to be stolen by digital crimes within a second or two. And then the intellectual property theft. I take only one Swedish high-tech industry, which I know has roughly 30,000 serious attacks every week by uh, intruders coming from different countries trying to get the intellectual property and if they do it they are going to use it so protection of that from the security point of view of course extremely important and then we need to protect the national infrastructure and we need to protect the global infrastructure and the global infrastructure is fairly resilient and fairly redundant but should also be protected we had an incident a couple of years ago when suddenly 
traffic between Europe and Asia was seriously impaired. And it turned out that someone had by accident cut a couple of cables outside of Alexandria in Egypt, because a lot of the cables, the fiber cables, go through the Suez Canal, obviously. And if you have an anchor or if you have something else and the cables get ruptured, then you are in trouble. But the redundancy by the cables, by the satellites, is enormously important. It is fairly redundant, but we need to think about it anyhow. Self-defense in different respects is important. And then the more serious security issues that was indicated. I mean, Stuxnet was a Rubicon of our time. For the first time, I guess, we had active cyber warfare. Someone, a nation actor, actively destroying the infrastructure of another country. The laws of war apply. So that, under the laws of war, that nation had the right to strike back by whatever means they considered appropriate, formally speaking. But then, of course, the problem of attribution is there to some extent, who is responsible. But we can, there are ways, increasingly there are ways of sorting out the problem of attribution. And just add one remark on that sort of things. Um, cyber weapons have one feature normally, you can deal with it, but anyhow, one feature that is different from normal kinetic weapons. If, if you bomb someone, the bomb goes off and the bomb is gone. You can't reuse the bomb for other obvious reasons. But if you deploy a cyber weapon, the cyber weapon is often there. And if you are smart enough, you can take the cyber weapon, you can re-engineer it, and you have the weapon. And you can send it back or send it somewhere else. So you can reuse the cyber weapon. So if you deploy a very sophisticated weapon against someone, be careful, it can be sent back to you. And it can proliferate. Someone has tried to may develop theories on cyber war comparing with nuclear war. I think the appropriate analogy is probably biological warfare. You don't know where the virus ends up at the end of the day. It is profoundly, it is profoundly dangerous. Power issues are, of course, uh, very important. You can say that what we see now is that networks are challenging hierarchies everywhere, from Tunisia to China, to France, to Russia, to Ukraine. And hierarchies are fighting back with whatever means they have. They are building their great firewalls to try to protect them. They are instituting vast systems of cyber censorship of different sorts. But so far, I would argue, the hierarchies are losing the battle against the networks, also because what we find is that at the other end of the networks are these immensely innovative 16-year or 14-year or 18-year-old, mostly boys, but also girls, always, nearly always, outsmarting the hierarchies. But here we also have political battles. The battle for the freedom of the net is the new front line for the battle of freedom in the world when it comes to challenging authoritarian and dictatorial regimes, even North Korea will not be able to withstand the digital world intruding upon the powers of the dictatorship. And then all of the difficult issues of privacy and surveillance that are there. States have security responsibility. And those res security responsibilities, they apply in the net domain as well but they must be regulated by law. And they must be exercised in such a way that they are seen by the citizens as legitimate. And here, of course, we have an ongoing debate that is quite profound. I saw that the French Senate the other day passed a law which is extremely wide-ranging on the rights of surveillance and intrusion in this country, or in that country, perhaps. We are in Monaco. But uh, that, of course, is something that is very relevant. And privacy will be increasingly important. It was mentioned that in the European Union, we have now said we're going to regulate these 2015. It's a highly difficult issue, because different generations see privacy in different lights. 
and is also an issue of profound economic importance. One of the big drivers of economic change is going to be big data. And if you look at it from a European point of view versus America, we see the American economy having an enormous competitive advantage in terms of energy, which is going to affect us more and more. And the second big advantage is going to be its big data advantage if we mess up our privacy protection. We can't afford in Europe to lose out competitive advantages in both energy and big data, and that will impact upon these issues as well. Governance issues will be at the forefront. It was mentioned the ecosystem of governance, the infrastructure, the Internet Architecture Board, the IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, the ICANN and others, the 13 root servers that we have over the world, well, mostly in the US, one in France and one in Sweden has to be said, but the rest of them are actually in the United States, that actually run the internet. And this is under attack by um, some governments, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia. But it has to be said that this system of governance has been exceedingly successful. It had made possible the fastest and the widest diffusion of a technology revolution that we've ever seen. It has made the technology available freely to more or less everyone. It has contributed to entrepreneurship and innovation in the cyberspace of a profound nature. We should be very careful not to make that over-regulated by international bodies to such an extent that we play into the hands of regimes that might have a slightly different agenda from the agenda of entrepreneurship and innovation and open societies. That's going to be a big battle ahead, whether we keep a global internet and an open governance system, or whether we go for a balkanization of the net. You can say either an open, transparent, and dynamic net in the future, or a closed control and static one with all of the implications of that. This is, among other things, going to be one of the big political battles ahead. These are just some of the issues. They are vast for each and every one. And this is uh, bound to be, in my opinion, uh, one of the, among all of the issues that we can say when we survey the domain of politics that are going to be more important five or ten years down the road or 15 years down the road. These are the issues that are the rapidly growing issues of political importance throughout the world. This is the new domain of diplomacy. This is the new, new domain of international politics. Thank you, Carl. Just uh, after this uh, exciting introduction, and I could notice the, the room had been uh, uh, quite silent and full of attention, our chairman Thierry gave me uh, 15 more minutes because we started late. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, can we now take a, a few contributions or questions? Here, I have... Carl Kaiser, Harvard University. Uh, Carl, you made a very important point about two major advantages of the United States over Europe, energy, we don't deal with that here, big data. Are you saying that in the long run the Europeans have to give up their concept of privacy, which is very different from the American concept of privacy, and the Europeans among themselves have very different cultures when it comes to privacy. In order to regain an advantage, could you explain what will be the long-term approach? I guess we should take a few contributions, maybe. Yeah, you had one. Please stand up, I, I saw. Uh, as everybody, I was very much impressed. Uh, but could you uh, please, all of you, make uh, one step further? I mean, Carl did it, but only uh, half a step. What does uh, that mean to the social uh, and political structure of the world? I mean, it's not only 
IT revolution which is speeding up. It's all the robotization, it's bio, bio and uh, that means that in five to 10 years, for example, uh, probably most manufacturing jobs will be not only out of Europe, but out of China. But that would create, I mean, a totally different world if we move along the road. I mean, and a world of uh, totally different social tensions, and the, the, the and these will uh, underlie politics of tomorrow, which will be quite different from an hour. So, could you please, I mean, think a lot of, of uh, the social political consequences of what you are talking about? Thank you. John Egan, uh, CEO of Sandbox in London. Um, for the three and a half billion people on the planet under the age of 27, is this migration to online community and mutual cause actually signifying a decline in the, in the fundamental power of the nation state? And perhaps what an awful lot of people see as apathy for younger generations with politics is actually an affinity that crosses borders uh, through technology. There. Yes. Uh, Fred Smith, a competitive enterprise institute. The following on the first question, the European concept of privacy seems to be that information about yourself is something we should wall out from the rest of the world. The American concept is privacy is a voluntary sharing of information with those you contractually agree with. It appears that the European concept of privacy grows out of the misuse of government acquired information in the 1930s in the World War II situation, and it hasn't been rethought to recognize that a voluntary exchange of information with whomever is perfectly compatible with privacy. But Europe seemingly has got to make a decision about that, or as Carl Bildt mentioned, you're going to forego the whole advantages of big data, which will be very harmful to your economy. Thomas Molaritas from APCO. Uh, Assange and Snowden uh, brought a real revolution in the West and especially in the US. Do you expect other people like that to act, not only vis a vis the US, but also in other parts of the world with Russia and China, for example? And what would be the consequences of that? Okay, over there. Majid Shakti from Kuwait. Uh, can we apply uh, the, well, the laws that we have today for the new technologies or we need to invent or write new laws for this? The second question I have is how can we as individuals who use the social media and the new media monetize the, the, uh, our effort, the contents that we put there and how much rights we have and who uh, can protect us as users? Maybe a last one, then. Oui, Leïl Choubi, ancien ministre algérien et puis enseignant. Sur les questions sécuritaires classiques, on, on, on a attendu une évolution assez importante avant de voir le débat de la sécurité. Euh, concerner toutes les grandes institutions multilatérales et la coopération internationale. Or, ce que l'on relève maintenant dans les, les questionnements, c'est que c'est plutôt des défenses nationales sur la question de, du cyberespace qui est cybercriminalité, qui est plus développée. Est-ce que vous voyez en la matière une nouvelle philosophie internationale mettant en, en intervention les institutions du type ONU qui commenceraient à se réformer pour se préoccuper et de ces questions et des grandes questions liées à la liberté et à l'organisation d'une sécurité multilatérale okay, uh, what are the reactions? There were uh, a, a couple of questions on uh, privacy and uh, the, the, the European nature, the European definition, and maybe a question on social infrastructure. Carl, you want to address that? No, I think the, 
the privacy data protection issues are exceedingly complex and, and, and important because they have sort of vast implications for uh, competitiveness and other things. I think here's a generational divide. I, I think how you, you define the US approach is what a substantial part of the younger generation in Europe would define it. Because if you go into, you signed up to the Google or Apple or whatever you signed up to, you tick the box and say, I agree. I mean, it's a fairly long text and it's fairly small print, but you do tick the box uh, and agree that your data is used in some sort of way. Um, and that is, from a legal point of view, fairly okay. Shouldn't people have the right to do that if they want to do it? I think they should. But what we should make certain is that they know what they are doing. And in that case, I think we should have sort of a merging gradually of the different European approaches with the US approach, because otherwise we will be in trouble, I would say. But there, as Carl said, I mean, that we have different histories in Europe. Um, uh, France has a state tradition, which is different from the German one, different from the Swedish one. And, but this will have to be sorted out. And this is one of the reasons why the European Council a month ago, two months ago, whenever it was, when it was dealing with the telecommunications regulation issues and the data services and whatever, said this is so difficult, let's defer it to 2015. I think that was wise because we need more of a debate on it. And it is a question of the long-term competitiveness. There are areas where we have huge competitive advantages in Europe. We have national health systems which means that we have national databases for the health of our citizens. If we use big data technologies on that, we can learn enormous amount in order to make enormous advantage in health, which the US can't, so there we have an advantage. Uh, other small point, apathy with politics among young people, I don't agree, I don't agree. There might be apathy with politics as performed, but I see a rising interest in issues, including global issues, because young people now connect with issues to a much larger extent than they, not with the policy packages of parties to the same extent as used to be the case, but with the issues. And they can connect to the issues and learn about the issues in new ways. So I think there's a rising interest in the issues of politics, not necessarily with the classical instrument of politics. Global governance, yeah, it will be affected by this, needless to say, but I think we need to understand that we need sort of an agreement on basic principles. Uh, not necessarily change them. Protection of freedom should apply online as well as offline, not that every country respects it. Uh, we should respect the independence of business. We should respect the, pri the right of individuals for their privacy, but they can dispose of it in their own different ways. And then we must have said, look at uh, where it's heading. Sergei Karaganov asked, where, where are we heading? I don't know. I don't know where we're heading. Uh, we are heading into a much more dynamic environment and accordingly more um, unpredictable. But I would say the societies that will prosper are the societies that have an incentive for innovation. The most snappy society, the most snappy economy, is the one that's going to be ahead 30, 40, 50 years down the road. The static, the regulated ones, are the ones that are going to lose out. Just rapidly, because we will conclude soon. May, uh, there were two questions. Uh, first question was, could there be Assange on Snowden coming from uh, France. China, Korea, or... France? France. France. It's probably easier, but the just question was more in some <laughs> dictator country. Snowden in France, when we, we probably have that already. Snowden. So first question and my second question would be, uh, today we, we talk about, uh, uh, I would say, digital war. Uh, can, is that totally national? Can we see global organization dealing with that? So, Mayor? First, I'd like to say that the internet is here to stay. We don't have the option, which was once people would think, if we, have, if we will be attacked, we will Talk the switch off. There is no switch killer for internet because we cannot manage anything without internet today. So the problem is how country can defend itself from attacks and still functioning. It's not enough to defend yourself against attack. You have to keep your internet system because otherwise you cannot operate yourself. Today it's it here to stay. So when the 
a friend from Kuwait ask who is protecting us. I'm telling you, no one. Of course, you can buy, you know, protection, antivirus, etc. But you will never believe how it is easy to really get into your phones, listen to every word you say, intercept any SMS you send. Maybe if we have, uh, said to Mr. Thierry, if we have uh, in the future next another discussion about uh, cyberspace, which I think is very interesting, maybe I can bring somebody who demonstrates how easy it is to take your phone call, your phone here, and show you that he can put your phone as a microphone. Doesn't matter wherever you are, even if you switch it off, they can listen to every word you say, doesn't matter where you are. Or you can, they can see, it's unbelievable. So if you want to protect yourself, keep everything you want to be secret, secret. Don't use <laughs> any smartphone, any computer, anything, because everything is exposed. Nobody really protecting you. About how do, is there going to be more celodens in different places like China or Russia? I think, yes. It's a matter of time. And I think Senodan create an example to a lot of young people who are working in those systems to come out and shout. That's what happened in Senodan, it can happen again. Last but not least, governments have the ability as well today, especially big governments and sophisticated governments, to intercept any of your phone calls by satellite. They don't have. They can, if you want, if any government wants you, United States is a very good example to that, want to see what you are doing, with whom you're speaking, what email you send, everything. They can intercept especially everything you do 24-7, which means possibilities are almost unlimited. There is no legislation today in the world about cyberspace. I think we should and we need, and uh, Carl said before and justifically that from the point of view of justice, when there is a cyber attack, in the regular law of war, if somebody attack you, you have the right to protect yourself in any means you have. Cyber attacks is not still defined by the law. Mm -hmm. I think it should be defined. Mm -hmm. There is today a lot of cooperation between countries from certain, I know from our point of view at least, we have cooperation with many countries in the world, especially Western countries, to in this area. But I think we should create some kind of glo uh, uh, world government governance in order to find the different ways what every country should do and should not should it should not do. Just a, a, a few words, Mr. Chang. The question that came was, what will be the social infrastructure of the digital world? So, seeing that from the media angle, what can you tell us as a conclusion? Uh, I like to. Uh clear uh, three questions. Uh, number one, uh, on the uh, privacy issue. Uh, there is no privacy whatsoever. Uh, so uh, be prepared to live without privacy. As long as you carry these uh, smartphones, uh, you are checked everywhere. Maybe you get checked uh, every five, ten minutes, wherever you go. And uh, you will buy uh, smart television, right? And uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy watching smart television. And in the meantime, set the box will watch you, whatever you do, in your room, okay? So privacy is gone, okay? Uh, that's for sure, no matter what you do. And uh, on the monetization issue, uh, you know, the intellectual people like here, sitting here, uh, more than willing to pay for content. Uh, I've launched uh, e-paper uh, several months ago, and I already have uh, 20,000 subscribers who's paying uh, about $10 a month. And I hope to increase this number to 200,000, uh, maybe in several years. So people are more than willing to pay for the, what they, you know, have, I mean, if it's good service, uh, the people are more than willing to pay. So monetization will continue. And lastly, uh, somebody asked for social consequences of uh, the challenges in uh, internet space, okay? I think uh, we have to worry about social uh, disintegration might happen. And uh, 
yesterday morning at the uh, opening session, uh, economists uh, talked about uh, unequal economy, the gaps between the rich and the poor. I think uh, that will increase and expand. Uh, somebody, uh, I think it's, it was Cohen Tyler, uh, Professor Tyler, he uh, uh, checked on this issue. Uh, it used to be 2080 society, 20% uh, of people uh, sort of uh, overtaking 80% of the rest of people. But the number is going to be different. Uh, it's going to be 15%. Uh, workers will uh, thrive and the rest of people uh, might uh, suffer a little more. Okay, that's my uh, answer to several questions. Just a, a, a very few words to conclude. The first point is uh, Capgemini has put the kind of uh, digital transformation at the forefront of his mission. And I think, uh, Thierry, uh, the digital transformation of the world has started, is accelerating. I think we will have to understand the roots of what we would call the digital welfare, the digital diplomacy, Military people understand more and more what is the digital defense and more and more a bigger share of defense budget are, are now allocated to cyber defense, fast growing. The digital global governance, so my bet theory is that, that this question will come more repeatedly in the agenda of your seventh, eighth and ninth world policy conference and I hope this was a good introduction. Thank you and how long is the break now? 25 minutes, said Thierry. Okay, thank you.